Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. Good afternoon, Team Krulak community. And on behalf of Marine Corps University, the Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Brew Krulak Center for Innovation and Future Warfare, welcome back to the Brewcast, our series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best in innovative and creative thought. I'm your host, Major Ian Brown, the Operations Officer at the Krulak Center. Before we begin, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Krulak Center, Marine Corps University, the United States Marine Corps, German Armed Forces, or any other agency of the U.S. or German governments. So today, we're pleased to be hosting one of our new slate of Team Krulak non-resident fellows, Colonel Zenki Marahrens. Colonel Marahrens is the head of the Research Department Strategy and Armed Forces at the German Institute for Defense and Strategic Studies, or GIDS, in Hamburg. The GIDS is a cooperation between the Bundeswehr Command and Staff College and the Helmut Schmidt University to promote public discourse and strategic culture in Germany. He is a trained air defense officer and has held various positions, including Battalion Command, Defense Planning Office, and Ministry of Defense. His past writing has focused on innovation, concept development, and experimentation of applied military scientific issues in the field of cyber and digitization. In 2018, he graduated from the Canadian National Security Program with a master's in public administration. His current work focuses on aspects of leadership, leadership processes, and leadership in the 21st century, modern forms of conflict, cyber, artificial intelligence, and the military, as well as the Prussian war game. His presentation today will focus on Germany's strategic culture or why the German armed forces are the way they are. Sir, thank you for joining us, and I will turn the presentation over to you. Ian, thank you very much, and it's a great honor to be a senior fellow with Krulak, and I'm really looking forward for the next year. German and strategic, Germany and strategic culture may be an unexpected paradox, and this is where we go through. Whenever you have a question, please proceed like, like uh, Ian has told you. And I have uh, two caveats in here. This presentation contains facts and opinions, which I alone consider appropriate and correct for the subject. And like Ian, it doesn't uh, be a governmental position. And uh, the next thing, I'm a third generation Air Force military family member. So it might be that some of my army or Navy colleagues might have different opinions of what I, I am telling you. But um, I took both of my both of my grandfathers fought in World War II and both survived by chance only. And my father joined the Bundeswehr already in 1955 to become a pilot, which didn't work out. And he became later on a logistics staff officer and um, went off duty in 1991 from the Territorial Command of Germany, working uh, a lot of time with the US forces coming back to Germany during exercises. And he had a lot of connections to the United States at that time. Strategic culture. And this is a definition I use for this evening. The logic of strategic culture then resides in the central belief that collective ideas and values about the use of force are important constitutive factors in the design and execution of states' security policies. Or saying it in short, when is a society willing to use military to cope with their interests? And for this, you have to understand Germany. Heinrich Heine once wrote, whenever I think of Germany at night, I can't sleep. Or in a short version, I just go back 103 years from today. You will find seven different Germanys. You will have the German Empire until November 8, 1918. And the army of the German, the Imperial Army at that time was an army of armies. So, for example, Bavaria and uh, Badenia had their own armies at that time, and they were just following the empire. From the Weimar Republic, formed on uh, November 11th until uh, the Third Reich and Adolf Hitler took power in 1933, the German armed forces were the so-called Reichswehr, and there were only 100,000 soldiers, which was a direct uh, outcome of the Versailles Treaty. Uh, under the Third Reich, you had a couple of uh, military formations. Of course, you had the Wehrmacht, which came out of the Reichswehr, 
We had uh, the political uh, forces, the SS, who were guarding the concentration camps, but there were also the weapons SS. Then there was a kind of militia, the, so, uh, the SA in the beginning. And in the final days of the war, Hitler activated what he called the Volkssturm. So every boy uh, starting with 16 until old men in the age of 60 were uh, drawn into the Wehrmacht to fight for uh, the German, the Third Reich. Between 1945 and uh, now different, uh, 1949 and uh, in the eastern part and in the western part, Germany was uh, divided in four occupation zones with no military. In uh, 1949, in the Soviet occupation zone, the German Democratic Republic was founded and it founded its own army, the National People's Army, on the third of uh, on the first of March, 1956, whereas the German, uh, the Western German side, being founded on uh, in May 1949, and the Bundeswehr, which was founded on 12/11/1955, um, and at that time uh, Germany was already a member of NATO. And then we had uh, after the fall of the Ber Berlin Wall, we had the reunification of um, both parts. And uh, for this, it might be quite interesting to understand that the reunification was from a legal perspective, not a reunification. It was an enlarged continuation because uh, when they worked through the process of reunification, they suddenly found out that if we reunify and create a new German, Germany, that all member, international memberships of Germany would be uh, deceased at that moment. Uh, as well as other parts. So, for example, there would be no uh, civil code of law until a new constitution would be would have been written at that time. So, uh, the lawyers came up with the idea that the five new countries on the soil of the former German Democratic Republic each asked to uh, enter the Federal Republic of Germany, and this was uh, finished on the. Uh, on the 3rd of October 1990, which is now our uh, national holiday. Before in the West, it was always uh, the 17th of June, because in uh, the 17th of June 1956, there was an uproar in the German Democratic Republic, which was fought back by the police and the military, as well as the Russians. And to remember those uh, who were fighting uh, for freedom on, the, on that day, on the western side, there was a national holiday on the 17th of June. So, how did we start after 1945? And you can see the guy on the left side, a, a, a German soldier sitting in front of the Reichstag in Berlin, and maybe telling his, his stories. So, on the one hand, there was a Reichswehr trauma from 1923. Directly after the World War One. there well, the official Reichswehr, but there were also a lot of uh, militias in Germany. And due to those, uh, you could say, revol revolutionary conditions at that time in Germany, there was an uproar and the uh, Secretary of, uh, sorry, the Chief of Defense at that time told in a critical situation, the uh, Secretary of Defense who came from the Social Democrats, that the Reichswehr won't fight Reichswehr unit units uh, which will fight against the state. And uh, this causes a trauma which you still can see inside our actual legislation, which denies, for example, um, uh, immediate uh, use of military forces inside Germany. Of course, there's a different story between the war in the West and the war in the East. If you look it up in book, Book, you have seen the war in the West against the, the Americans and, and the Allies. It's always like um, the, uh, the white knight against the um, black knight, whereas Germany is uh, the, uh, the black knight and the rest of them are the white knights. Whereas the war in the East, even if you look it up in, uh, in book, it always looks like uh, um, I want to title of the book, uh, the, book uh, uh, the Ring, where it's about uh, 
Western society against the Orcs. And if you compare this with the American writing of history with regards to how they see the war in the West and their war fighting uh, Japan, it's almost similar. Whereas on the left side, it's about knights fighting each other with honor. On the right side, it's the war of game throwers and so on. And there was also uh, a story after uh, World War II arising, which said we had the innocent Wehrmacht versus all the evil came from the SS. And uh, to be fair, uh, this is something uh, which modern uh, history and historians uh, cannot sign up any, any longer. Uh, what is true that the SS was part of the Nuremberg trials, the German general staff was part of the uh, was accused at the beginning, but then was released because they said, what is the job uh, of, a, of a general staff is to fight and to plan wars for their countries. And by this, the allies uh, released the Wehrmacht from the processes. But if you look deeper inside, and I will follow up this later on, you will find that there was a lot of um, Wehrmacht taking part in the Holocaust and taking part in killing people in the in the the east so the story of the innocent Wehrmacht uh, you cannot hold if you look into the history then you have the 20th uh, the 20th july of 1944 there were a couple of trials of assassinations uh, against hitler already from the beginning and he some, uh, somehow survived all of them but uh, for the german military the most important one is the one uh, Stauffenberg conducted. Stauffenberg, as a, as a military, he was uh, the planning mind be behind it, and he tried to set a, uh, a bomb in the Wolfschanze next to Hitler. And I think all of you have seen the movie. You, uh, by accident, uh, his luggage was put to the wrong side of the, uh, of the large table, so the detonation didn't uh, hit Hitler at that time. There was always a question whether it was necessary or still necessary at that time we know from uh the german casualty figures of that time that um between the 1st of september 1939 and the 6th of uh, uh, june 1944 when the allies landed in normandy and from the 6th of june until 8th of may when the war has ended germany had the same losses in numbers so a successful assassination of, uh, 90, uh, of, of Hitler in 1945 and maybe a, a direct peace or a controlled peace would have uh, rescued a lot of life. For the armed forces later on, with regards to what you can use as a tradition, here the problem in the beginning rose that uh, by nature Stauffenberg was a, uh, was a traitor. He has worn his own personal uh, on the person of Adolf Hitler, and he broke his or, uh, his oath by uh, trying to assassinate uh, the Führer. On the other hand, people saying, "Okay, he took over personal responsibility when he saw that he was misled, and uh, this making him a resistance fighter." And by uh, with this argumentation, uh, this line of argumentation. He is one of the main lines of German, uh, German armed forces tradition today. Of course, we had uh, the Potsdam conference. There were a lot of discussion how a Germany in the future after World War II should look like. At the beginning, there was a threat from Morgenthau in 1944. Uh, he was in the US uh, Department of Finance, and he said, we will create a farmland Germany. There will be no industry we will prevent the Germans from uh, building weapons again. Uh, this plan uh, was leaked and came never active. And in 1946-1947, when uh, the Allies saw what uh, happens on the other side of the, uh, the Iron Curtain, they changed to the Marshall Plan, which on the one hand was a uh, plan to bring money to rebuild Europe, in order to um, contain and throw back the Russians, but also with a educational part, especially for the Germans, in order to make them Democrats 
and uh, to give them a chance to learn from the mistakes uh, that uh, they made the 12 years before. On the other hand, with regards to the Wehrmacht, and especially to uh, the history writing on uh, World War II, the US history, military history department interviewed a couple of German generals, uh, especially with the idea using their knowledge for a possible next war, which everyone was clear would be against the Russians. And uh, Manstein's book, Lost Victories, is a good example for it because he was able to clean himself by just telling those part of the stories he wanted to tell and not all parts. For example, uh, the parts uh, he was totally aware of uh, the so-called Einsatzgruppen who were killing people behind his forces and also of the Holocaust. Uh, he didn't, wrote, uh, didn't write anything about that in his book. So in 1950, the US uh, at a certain point in time uh, thought uh, about their future being in um, Europe and they also made an assessment, a security assessment of that time and they said we are, we are leaking at least 12 divisions in the middle of Europe, especially when we start to draw down our forces in Europe. And to cover this, there were so-called secret talks in Himmerod between former German generals, German politicians and the Americans which under the German law, the constitution at that time was high treason. But for Adenauer, the, chance, the chancellor at that time, uh, he was well aware of it and uh, he saw the necessity of Germany to become a sovereign nation again, to have an army as well. And inside these talks, the German generals pressed Eisenhower for an honor declaration on the German soldier. And you can read it uh, on my slide. Because otherwise the German soldiers uh, told him, if you want to raise a German army and you're coming out up with this declaration, we will prevent uh, you from getting a German army. So the German parliament, when they became aware of it, they were not that amused of Adenauer's plan. Uh, they supported it but they put a high price tag on this new army, which became the Bundeswehr. The German armed forces are constitutional subject to the parliament, which is different to, uh, um, to other countries. The employment of forces inside the country was forbidden. This is the Weimar experience or what I call the Reichswehr experience before. And the oversight of financial issues, procurement and animal had to be conducted by civilian organizations under civilian leadership, which is also a Reichswehr experience. Maybe you remember that uh, Iraq was hiding weapons uh, between the two wars, Iraq war and Iraq two. By nature, German, German uh, former German officers and German officers of the Reichswehr were masters in hiding weapons between 1918 and 1933. Almost every military sector in Germany had hidden storage uh, where they took weapons from World War I and stored them for a future army. And these experience made the parliament, uh, the German parliament to put the price tag on this new army. So at the end, uh, a Bundeswehr was founded in, in 1955, 1956 uh, with the idea of having 12 land divisions a supporting tactical air force with some strategic assets and a navy uh, able to operate the Baltic Sea and the North Sea. And uh, there were no national operational or strategic level headquarters. This kind of command was directly handed over to NATO. And this is something what you still see in Germany today. We have only one operational maybe a little bit strategic level headquarter with the Einsatzführungskommando. But the task of the Einsatzführungskommando is, with one exception, only national support of German armed forces deployed worldwide. And the only mission uh, they are able to plan and to conduct and to lead as an operational strategic headquarter is the freeing of German hostages in a critical simulation somewhere worldwide. 
so and there was a clear understanding after world war ii because it was not only world war uh two it was also world war one that no war shall ever again start from germany and this was a shared understanding and this was written in our constitution which you can see on this slide article 26 of our constitution says extending to and undertake is intent to disturb the peaceful relations between nations especially to prepare for a war of aggression shall be unconstitutional they shall be criminalized and in the beginning when german forces went abroad this caused a little bit of problems because uh, we are allowed to go abroad under a mandate from nato united nations and eu but normally this uh, process of mandating is parallel to military planning processes but by uh, the article i just read to you this was impossible so they had to do some changes and um there was also there's also one uh, in the german criminal code this was re replaced in 2017 with uh, uh, a similar section from the humanitarian uh, law which states almost the same thing and uh, one of um, another, we call it tripstone or tripwire, is that in our um, constitution it says the declaration of a state of defense must be taken uh, under uh, the determination that the federal territory is under attack by armed forces or immediately imminently threatened. With such an attack, state of defense shall be made by the Bundestag with the consent of Bundesrat. And from this comes that German, Germany will only be at war if the German Bundestag declares we are in a war. And this caused later on, especially in Afghanistan, uh, a lot of problems for the soldiers because the soldier had a clear understanding and feeling that they were fighting inside a war, but from a national perspective, they were just on mission. And this caused, uh, especially with the German army, uh, some uproar between the ranks because they had a feeling that the society and the politicians were not understanding uh, in a real way what's going on in, after, uh, in, in Afghanistan and what uh, is happening for the German soldiers because it was a peacekeeping, uh, somehow more a peacekeeping mission or seen as a peacekeeping missions. On the other hand, if you look into um, the realities after World War II, NATO has a con had a conventional defense and every nation marker which you see at the front line in the blue fields where one core at that time, one core at that time equals uh, three divisions. So you can see the amount of soldiers forward deployed to uh, defend against a strike from the east. On the second slide, it was also a US nuclear planning map. And the Germans were aware that they only were lucky in 1945 that the um, American forces were so far into Germany already that the nuclear bombs, which were originally planned for Germany, were then applied in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. There were already plannings for Germany and I once uh, read something that target number one would be Hanover and another one would be Ludwigshafen Mannheim, slightly north of Stuttgart. And another paper I've read about Leipzig or Dresden. On the other hand, which you see on, on the right side of my slide, this is the conventional attacks from uh, how the, the Russians planned to uh, attack and to run over Germany within six days in order to come to the Atlantic to prevent uh, uh, American redeployments to, um, to Germany. And on the lower part, that they would have used tactical nuclear bombs on German territory. So the German uh, military was well aware of this planning and the German civil society had a clear understanding that in the next war, Germany would be a conventional and a nuclear battlefield. So starting after World War, 
war too especially from the experience uh the german armed forces had with swearing their oaths on uh, uh adolf hitler uh, which was an offer by the german uh, by the wehrmacht in 1934 uh, they changed that their soldiers would swear their oaths on, on the constitution, not on a person. And uh, Graf von Baudissing, that you see on the right side, Count von Baudissing, uh, being a military leader, came up with a special concept of leadership development and civic education. And he created the idea of the citizen in uniform, which has almost the same rights than the normal citizens. But there is no extra class of guardians uh, outside uh, the, uh, the German um, um, civil society. So every soldier is also part of the civil society. Um, this concept of interview also deals as a good service concept already over the last 60 years. And so far, it prevented us from having uh, war crimes on our missions abroad and we have seen other nations coming to germany and asking what did you put in there and how do you train this and how do you educate your soldiers in being so and then directly in the beginning someone came up with the idea to found a kind of military union which we call the bundeswehrverband and uh, they did a lot of um, in changing politics for soldiers and and their families uh, creating a better environment. And to be fair, at the beginning, when a colonel saw that this kind of union was founding it, he reported back to uh, the Ministry of Defense, I have a kind of revolution here. But later on, uh, uh, when uh, the government went into it, it said, yes, of course, these are the rights in accordance with the, with the Constitution. So this is po uh, possible. But it doesn't have full union rights. For example, soldiers can't strike. And then you had a discussion um, always, especially uh, when it changed, when we later went on missions. What kind of soldiers are we? Are we Athenians? So Democrats who um, take weapons in order to defend their uh, statehood? Or are we Spartans, someone who is trained for military service? And this is his uh, purpose of, of life. And this. It's like a pendulum which always moves from the left to the right, but the idea of the or the original idea of the citizen in uniform goes with the idea of the Athenians. It's a great metaphor. It doesn't work every time, but to understand some of the discussions inside the German armed forces, that's a great metaphor, especially when you have talks between the army and the air force. Germany at a certain point in time had to regain an idea how to apply deadly force, because after what happened, uh, especially during the Third Reich, under the, uh, using the capital punishment, not only for, for capital crimes, but also for political uh, crimes, sometimes uh, even very low crimes. I just went through the list today. For example, a foreign, uh, a foreign worker who was a slave worker had an affair with a German female and he was caught, and this was by this he got a capital punishment. So, in the Article 102 of our Constitution, from the first day of the Federal Republic of Germany, the capital punishment was abolished. This caused then some problems, especially on the side of the police, and uh, with regards to the Munich massacre at the Olympic Games of 1972. And I think many of you are aware of this. Uh, the German police had no idea, no concepts to fight terrorists. They were understaffed, undermanned, which caused uh, a lot of troubles, and at the end, a lot of victims uh, beneath the Israeli hostages taken by the Palestinian terrorists. This uh, was also the founding hour of the GSG-9, which is a German police anti-terror unit with snipers and everything you can uh, imagine, and uh, already, a couple of years later, the GSG-9 was sent to Mogadishu. Um, the picture you can see in the middle on the right side to free a German aircraft being kidnapped by Palestinian and, and uh, I think it was only Palestinian terrorists, uh, which tried to free the German RAF, the Rote Army Fraction, Red Army Fraction, which was a German terror group. 
where the German uh, government was able to keep the four leading uh, people, two males and two females, inside a German prison, and they tried to free them. Then in 1994, uh, when the problems started and the genocide in Rwanda took place, uh, Germany was not able to send his own uh, its own troops to Africa, so Belgian paratroopers rescued 12 German citizens from a German uh, uh, radio station. And our Secretary of Defense at that time said this will never happen again. So we uh, had the foundation of the German Special Forces with a special focus on uh, hostage um, situations in a war environment, which is beyond the capabilities of the police anti-terror units. And so far under German law, the rescue of German citizens, like I said before, is the only national mission we will conduct on our own with our own assets. Uh, if there are other partners, uh, we will join other partners, but this is the only mission when it's about German citizens, which will be conducted by or blend by uh, the German armed forces. So when the Berlin Wall failed in 1989, and this might be interesting for US, well, the army of reunification on September, uh, October 3rd, 1990, there were 500,000 soldiers in uh, the Bundeswehr on the Western side and 180,000 soldiers from the National People Army. Um, we integrated 60,000 from the Eastern side, released uh, 120,000. All the Eastern um, soldiers were asked whether they had a commitment with the uh, Stasi, the um, uh, GDR's security, uh, secret or uh, internal secret service, and nobody was kicked out when he had a, a relationship or a task with them, only when it would be proven, uh, only when it could be proven that he did something uh, not in accordance with German law, but we kicked soldiers out who lied. So they had to make a cross, and when we found out later on, for example, he said, I had no contact with the Stasi, and we found out later on by checking papers that he was a member or that he was con a contact for the Stasi. We kicked them out because he lied in the process of uh, application. So over the last uh, now 31 years, uh, the so-called peace dividend of peace in Europe forced that Germany went down from 680,000 soldiers down to 170,000 soldiers. This was the lowest planning around uh, 2010. And at the moment, we are back and we have granted post by the parliament for 204,000 uh, German soldiers, all services. Understanding that what happens in Ukraine and Crimea causes problems in the uh, European security environment, and this is one of the answers for that. Um, in the times of 1990, and especially some of the, uh, the other ones of the Americans will remember this, when the Americans went to Iraq 1, Germany at that time had to balance 600,000 Russian soldiers still on German soil. They created the eastern part of a Russian army, and they, uh, in order to bring them back, Germany contracted Turkish companies and other companies to build uh, houses and so on in Russia in order to give them a housing and uh, we paid for their transport back to Russia. And by this, Germany balanced uh, the German, uh, the US troops who were out to uh, Iraq in 1993 in Kuwait. And of course, Germany became a full sovereign state under the two plus four contract, which is not a full peace contract. It was only um, between the two Germanys and the former four uh, occupation nations, because they found out at the end, I think it was 99 states who, uh, being in war with Germany and it was impossible to, um, to create a full uh, peace treatment, but this contract is seen as uh, the final document ending uh, World War II. 
So fighting wars, which do not constitute a war, this is something I already started uh, to talk about uh, when I uh, show you, um, I gave you the German constitution uh, articles on what we see as war, as the state of defense. However, immediately after 1989, we started to go abroad to help our allies. There were already missions before German armed forces in uh, foreign countries. For example, in the 1960s, there was an earthquake in Africa and some, uh, in Morocco and also supporting uh, the Italians after a, a huge earthquake. So there were help missions and humanitarian missions uh, done by German forces, but we never deployed before 1989 forces outside Germany. And this started with Somalia and Cambodia as UN missions, then on the Balkans with the NATO mission, Afghanistan and Africa. In uh, 1994, German opposition called on the High Court uh, when, German, uh, when the German government decided to send NATO aircraft, which consisted of 30% German crews, to Bosnia, and the opposition said, no, you can't do this. This is preparing for a war, and this is impossible. But the High Court confirmed in 1994 the deployment, but setting at the same time the conditions and standard for future deployment of forces at the same time. And... Uh, the main condition is never alone, only with a mandate, either from United Nations, from NATO or EU, with the exception of the already meant freeing of German hostages. And by this, you might understand that we cannot follow the United States in collision of the willing if they are not mandated by one of those organizations, because that's the standard given by our High Court. So the first German soldiers fighting were German tornadoes together with the US uh, Air Force and the Allied forces over Kosovo and Serbia. Then we joined the United States in uh, 2001, 2002 in Afghanistan and 2013. We joined uh, the UN missions and the EU missions, especially with our French uh, allies in Mali and Africa. And what you see on the lower side, we lost in um, Afghanistan 53 German soldiers, and not only, and uh, uh, a couple of them also in war fighting missions, and the Gold Cross of Honor for Outstanding Deeds given to a US prisoner. The names you can see on my slide were given. These were the helicopter pilots uh, who rescued a, a German patrol which came under fire, under heavy fire, and the American. Uh, soldiers risk, uh, risk their own life to get the German soldiers out of um, the combat zone by evacuating them from directly from the battlefield under fire. So they were the first ones, first foreigners getting the new gold cross of honor for outstanding deeds, which was uh, created for um, war fighting only. So what you can see here now, this is where the German armed forces are uh, deployed at the moment, and due to the fact that we don't have a war, if you're not declaring being in a war, we have missions, and we have so-called uh, uh, missions which are similar to being on a mission. This is uh, um, also a legal term, and the problem comes with, for example, that the enhanced forward present is uh, a NATO mission to deter Russia, but it's uh, only in support of another NATO member. So it's not a, an Article 5 mission, and therefore this caused also problems for the soldiers, but uh, because the soldiers being there and being there for them in, uh, in a war fighting um, uh, or, or meeting war fighting standards, but not fighting, they would have had uh, legal issues, for example, getting the extra money and being abroad and stuff like that. So they came out with these new terms of uh, a task which are similar to mandated missions. And there you can see 
that sometimes it's not about war fighting, sometimes it's about the legal. And the other uh, missions you can see on the lower side, especially in the Mediterranean, they are sending NATO missions, also conducting, for example, rescuing of uh, migrants or um, surveying uh, weapon transports in the in the uh, Middle West. In the, in the Mediterranean, but by nature, they are not mandated missions. So the force size of the German armed forces, which you see on the left side from 1989, close to 500,000. Now in 2020, uh, 20, we are at 180,000. And for this, you have also to understand that this kind of peace dividend was also to balance inter-European uh, possible tensions, because you can see on the on the right side the size of our neighboring forces. So, in order not to destabilize Central Europe by having a Germany with a large uh, army, all our uh, reduction were also in line with France and UK, because we could always see if uh, Germany would do a step forward in taking leadership in the EU. At the same moment, there would be uh, special talks between France and UK, and maybe uh, even Poland was invited to those tasks. So in order to stabilize also Europe, not to uh, on, on a security level, uh, German armed forces reduction are in line with the reductions of our neighbors. So and then uh, after World War II, a society comes to grip with its Sorry, there's a, a typing mistake with its history. When in 1945, uh, the situation was nobody has been a Nazi, uh, at the Nuremberg and the Dachau trials, only the top 1,000 of the former Nazi party and the former administration uh, came in front of um, uh, a judge, especially the American judges in, in Nuremberg. In the 1950s, uh, the century of rebuilding, of rearmament of Germany, but also a strong European peace movement, because there was a common understanding uh, that the last war was so terrible that there should not be uh, the next war in Europe, that there should be a unified Europe. And there were a lot of police, uh, sorry, poli um, political movements by creating the West European Union and other uh, on the security side, but also creating the first uh, economic partnerships and alliances in order to start the process of building a unified Europe. And to be fair, if you read the, uh, the old paper, sometimes you have the feeling that the commitment for a unified Europe was much higher in the 1950s than you can see it today. Okay, the 1960s was about coping and suppressing history. There were the Auschwitz trials, so and um, so former guardians uh, of the German uh, concentration camps came in front of German judges, and by this uh, you could see because they were the same judges already dealing, uh, already being judges in the Third Reich, uh, the punishment were not that heavy than expected, and. Of course, at the same time, we had a rising anti-Americanism. Also, the Americans were still supporting us and defending us uh, against the Warsaw Pact and uh, the Russians, especially through the uh, anti-Vietnam movement of the United States, uh, states, which came over as a peace movement to Germany as well. Then there was with the uh, former um, head of Persia when he came to, to Germany due to the fact that his uh, secret police uh, we are acting in a brutal way, and also Israel came under um, under scrutiny of the German, uh, especially students and left wings, because they were the occupiers of Palestine. And and to be fair, that's the same story than their fathers had between 1933 and 1945. But they call themselves left wings, and now making the Jews against a victim. In the 1970, I think it was 77 or 78, the movie Holocaust was shown in, uh, on German TV. And this made clear to the German uh, population what had happened. 
and, and to be fair, we are 25, 30 years after what happening of a lot of no, uh, silence. Nobody wanted to talk about this. And suddenly it started. We have to think what happened during those 12 years. And that 6.6 .6 million Jews were killed, that gypsies were killed, that opponents were, uh, the political opponents were killed, that people for, uh, were killed for their beliefs or uh, being homosexual. But the 1980s then were, um, and uh, I showed you the, the nuclear planning for Europe, um, especially coined by the peace movement uh, versus uh, the NATO double track decision which said we need um, middle range missiles like the, which one was it? Uh, against the SS-20, the American Pershing. On the other hand, we were asking for uh, nuclear reduction talks for long range missiles. In the 1990s, there came a Wehrmacht exhibition, uh, which was founded by a, um, a German rich guy and uh, it came after scrutiny in the beginning for not being scientific enough, then it was reworked, but at the end, it came up with the question, granted, what did you do in World War II? And then we had to admit that the Wehrmacht was not uh, only the, uh, the clear or uh, the clean fighters, like the generals has uh, told the stories after World War War II, that there were uh, a lot of problems uh, in the Wehrmacht being part of um, the Holocaust, as well as being part of uh, killing peoples, especially in Russia and Yugoslavia or Italy. So 2000, especially after 2001, September 11, we committed to our partners. We supported the United States and Afghanistan immediately when um, the US uh, asked for help in Afghanistan. A side note, Iraq too, Germany was not taking part in the war fighting. This was a political decision of our former chancellor from the Social Democrats, Helmut um, Schröder at that time. But uh, we took over the protection of the US families and US forces left in Germany when, uh, when the forces uh, deployed out of Germany. And we committed on a daily base more than 2,000 soldiers to the protection of uh, US families and US citizens in Germany. Around 2010, especially after uh, budget cuts and budget plan cuts, 8 billion uh, euros uh, within four years, uh, the Chart had to make a decision saying, OK, homeland defense is not our priority. We are not preparing an army for deployment. We have to move to an army in deployment and we would change uh, our force structure. Then the Crimea uh, happened, Ukraine happened, and starting with uh, first speech in 2014, going over 2016, and now we have officially refocusing on national defense, allies defense, uh, which also put some pressure off our civilian society asking how to become resilient in a more and more complex world. We are also under attack from Russian hacker groups in the cyberspace. We have seen uh, ransomware attacks on German uh, hospitals and uh, other organizations. And we had also uh, an inference uh, from the Russia side when a young Russian girl called Lisa uh, vanished in Berlin for a couple of days, the Russian media transported the, the message to the Russian-born population of, of Germany. And we have quite a huge number, which are called former Russian Germans, still use Russian TV. And they got the message from Russia that the Germans are not taking care of Russian-born peoples, which was clearly uh, proven an, an information uh, operation. Uh, the German police found the girl a couple of days later, the problem was she was 13 and she had an 18 year old friend. Her parents denied the excess of the boy and she left the house. But this became an, a Russian uh, infosphere operations in Germany. So traditions, traditions, traditions. There's a lot of discussion in Germany about tradition. And uh, after 70 years, 
and this goes back to the 1960s, the Wehrmacht at all is not an official tradition line for the Bundeswehr because it was part of the national social uh, injustice regime. It served it and it was entangled into its crimes. Except the inclusion of individual members of the Wehrmacht, if they are deemed honorable, they can be part of official German traditions. For example, uh, that's also for Stauffenberg, because uh, he was also a Wehrmacht officer, and after uh, the first chapter, he couldn't be part of the tradition, but the, the German military resistance of the uh, July 20s is uh, one of the official tradition lines of the German armed forces. And so German strategic culture isn't, there's a high tension on the left side that we still have uh, the need and the inside feeling, especially on the army side, uh, to be warriors and to be accepted as warriors. And then on the other side, this is one of our famous, famous ads, <coughs> we are fighting that you can be against us because we are taking care of your free or uh, freedom, or like the Americans said, freedom isn't, isn't free. But that's a tension between the inside society and the self picture of the German armed forces. It's forces. It's, you could say it's almost a multi-dimensional problem. So my conclusion, driven by bitter lessons from Germany history and a deep reflection as part of the Allied re-education program after World War II, which belongs to the Marshall Plan, and furthermore, facing deep political and cultural identity insecurities, are we nationals or are we uh, uh, patri uh, pa patriots or how do we become patriots? Creates a paradox of why German strategic culture addresses at the moment everything, but not when and why Germany will deploy its fractional limited armed forces. But we are export world champion on the economic side. So this uh, kind of strategy not having a strategic culture is also supporting us uh, on the other side, on the economic side, which you can, can see here. It's moving over the time. Sometimes uh, the United States is a front, sometimes it's China. In the year uh, I put uh, this one up, Germany was, but Germany since the 1960s was always between uh, in the group of the first five as uh, of um, with the U, uh, largest export worldwide. So this concludes my uh, my my briefing on or my, my 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 lecture or whatever I wanted to tell today. And this is a question I got today from Ian. But if there are other uh, questions, we can start with them first. Ian, uh, Mike, back to you. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, sir. Um, and to the audience, I'll say, uh, yeah, if you have a question um, for our guests, go ahead and just tell me in the chat. Then I'll start calling on you in the order that we show up. But um, to that to that first question, um, yeah, sir, if you wanted to start off with that one, that one came from uh, Mr. Russ Evans over at our uh, continuing education program and distance education uh, training under Marine Corps University. Uh, so I want to make sure he gets proper attribution. But yeah, if you want to go ahead and just um, start off with that one, we can, we can go there. He was asking whether our Bundesamt für Verfassungsschutz or the Federal Office of the, uh, Protection for the Constitution is combating extremism in the German military. Yes, we are doing this, but we are not doing this with the uh, with the federal service. The military has its own counterintelligence service, for what we call the MAD, and they do, uh, on one hand, counterintelligence intelligence within the uh, the Bundeswehr, but they also are. Fight, uh, they're also fighting against uh, the extremist case. And uh, a, a problem I would say worldwide is that with the exception of countries where you have communism, uh, you have more people coming from the right joining the military because normally they're more conservative than in, in other states. So what you see in on the slides on the right side, and I just took the figures which I found today, so uh, at the moment, out of 180, 118,000 soldiers, we had in 2020, 850 cases of possible right-wing extremism. We have something which is called the Reichsbürger, the uh, citizens of the Reich. They are declaring that the German uh, Federal Republic did not, uh, does not exist. 
and that there is still a Reich uh, in the borders of 1937. They are not accepting uh, the, uh, the actual constitution. Then, as you can see, we have a small amount of left-wing extremisms in the middle, 16. Uh, we have um, Islam cases, popular cases of uh, Islamism, and uh, also foreign, and they call it Ausländer extremismus, could also be anti-Semitism, uh, which comes up to uh, a number of possible cases of 1,000. So one in 180 uh, is uh, a suspicion and they work them. But then you later on, you can find out there are three classes, red, uh, uh, yellow and green, and some people uh, changed uh, in, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I just read, I'm, I lost my, my, my thread. Um, it's an age thing. We have a lot of uh, right-wing extremism with the younger ones and the corporal, especially in the group of the corporals. And of course, at a certain point in time, we are finding out that not everyone who's a conservative by chance is a right-wing or right-wing extremist. So, and, and they get sorted out. And this is done by the military counter intelligence service. And we have seen a rise, um, but at the moment we believe that we see now that um, the, the colleagues of, his, uh, of uh, extremist soldiers are not covering them any longer. You know, like the group effect. You know, if I'm part of the group, I don't want to kick someone out, or maybe I'm the one who reports, get, you know, don't, don't shoot the, the piano player. So, but this changed over the years because we had uh, also some um, right-wing crimes in Germany. And we had a right-wing crime group as well as some, um, some guys uh, who use weapons either to attack um, a Jewish synagogue or who killed, I think it's all, almost uh, one year ago, 10 young um, um, Arabic, uh, Arabic looking German nationals uh, with a migration background uh, by shooting them in the city of Hanau close to Frankfurt. And this kind of right wing extremation changed uh, the habits of the German soldiers that, that they're also reporting in more. And then the uh, military intelligence service is looking after those cases. And this is well aware of the parliament. This is well aware of the, uh, the population asking us, what are you doing? Are you doing enough? What kind of training do you apply? And uh, there's mandatory training on inner Führung as well as on political education. Uh, and also uh, visiting concentration camps, another thing to make the young, especially the young soldiers aware of it. I did have one kind of uh, one more to jump off of that first question, actually, and then I'll go to the ones in the chat. And that was the uh, that recruiting slogan, that poster you had there. Um, you know, it's there's almost a contrarian element into it, into, you know, uh, um, you know, certainly some of the recruiting messages that that the United States does. And so I'm wondering that um you know that that very clear attitude of you know we're you don't have to like or even agree with us but we're, we're fighting to protect all of those freedoms whatever uh whatever your position is um how you know how, how does that impact your recruiting um you know is were, were these messages designed to sort of specifically resonate with a certain demographic that you're actively trying to recruit recruit and then does that also help back to this this first question does that recruiting approach kind of um help um, you know, prevent some of the more extremists on both both ends of your spectrum there from becoming an issue in the first place. Yeah, I can also put in the, the first question, the impression of the cultural and society changes began in 2010. Uh, in 2011, we stopped our mandatory service. And until that day, we didn't have a problem with recruiting because we recruited almost 40% of our NCOs and uh, corporals outside those uh, young men taking uh, taking the mandatory service because they came in, they saw, hey, it's, it's better than I saw, so I will stay, they signed up for longer. The problem we had, mandatory service in the, the beginning was 18 months, it was reduced to 15 months, and then somewhere around the 2000, it, it went down to six months. And to be fair, you can't train a soldier in six months. You have uh, three months of basic training, then you send him to a unit, 
and uh, he had a, uh, he has three weeks of leave because it's half a year inside the government, and then you have to kick him out. So we have only two months having those guys in the unit. And on the other hand, there was a problem. We were only capable of uh, drawing in 60,000 young men, but by uh, our constitution, it said we have not a, uh, a mandatory service of the best. We have a, mandis, uh, uh, a mandatory service for everyone. So uh, the chance for not getting drawn in was higher than getting drawn in. And this is under the constitution uh, inequality. And there was a chance that the German government would lose this in front of a court. So they said, OK, we are stopping the mandatory service. We, uh, we didn't uh, kick it out. We just put it dormant. But at the moment, you can't see any majority to get this kind of, of uh, civil service back uh, as, as military service back into the uh, into the society. On the other hand, we have a couple of discussions of uh, of the society saying, "Hey, maybe we need something like a military and civil service for one year." But there's also a problem in our constitution. Our constitution says forced labor is not allowed; is abolished. Same like have the punishment, which is also a follow of the Third Reich, which had the Reichsarbeitsdienst at that time. And only by the exception was uh, the military service, because someone said, if you, don't, if you can't defend your state and you're losing your state, then you lose everything. So this is not forced labor. This is protecting your country. But everything else would fall under this. And therefore, there's a, a couple of legal discussions about this. So yes, there was a kind of also cultural and society changes around 2010. We have seen in the recruitment at that time that we saw also, especially in the army, people who wanted to go abroad, what we call the adventure seekers, people who would also sign up for uh, the French Foreign Legion because they like to be in action. Whereas before having uh, every, almost every young man inside the military format, this was a, 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 di a different populace. Uh, with regards to, um, recruitment and there was the question of uh, females in there. We had the first females only in the medical service in the 1970s because we couldn't get enough doctors at that time. And after the German constitution, females were not allowed uh, to join the armed forces. In 2001, a young uh, lady went to the European High Court and said, this is inequality because I want to serve my country as well. And this changed the uh, the whole story, uh, and we are now getting the first females in higher leadership positions. So uh, senior colonels, the first one becoming generals. At the moment, we only have uh, generals in the medical service, but within the next years, we will also see females in uh, in the general or the admirals positions. But this is still a, a, a process going on in the medical service. We have almost 50% of, uh, sometimes more than 50% in the ranks. In the, the fighting forces, we are less than 70, uh, 7%. And we are going through all similar problems we have seen with our allies with regards to sexual harassment, toxic leadership, toxic, toxic mainhood. Uh, do we accept female ranks uh, to call? Um, a female officer with a female description because the German language has a possibility for a male and a female word. So, for example, there's a, if you have a baker, there's a female word for baker as well as a male word. And the ranks, for example, in the police are already having both of it. But there are strong discussions also from the inside. The female said, we don't want to have them. We don't want to be sorted out. I want to be a lieutenant and not a female lieutenant and stuff like that. So there's a lot of discussions going on. But with regards to recruitment, we have to go through those processes. All right, great. Thank you, sir. And I think uh, we, we covered uh, several questions there um, in the course of the discussion. So uh, I appreciate you uh, helping us check those all off as we go down. So um, next, I've got uh, so I'm bouncing back and forth between the, the Q&A and the chat here. Um, I'm going to go just a little bit out of order of the questioners so we can um, kind of package some questions together. So these kind of go, these now sort of switch tracks into 
uh, German approach to getting back to sort of the, the foreign employment of forces. So first uh, part of the question was a, a recent Financial Times piece that quoted Social Democrats uh, foreign policy spokesman Neil Schmidt is saying, we need a real foreign policy for China, not just a business oriented policy. What do you think of that comparison? And do you see a light? What are your thoughts on likelihood of that change? And then along with that, a, uh, a recent trip to the Indo-Pacific by um, Bay, uh, uh, Mr. Ms. Bayern, I'm not sure who that is myself, um, but uh, resulted in a Chinese rejection of the Bayern's plans to visit Shanghai. Um, out, outside of the business part, though, there's no additional sort of um, international security commitment in the Indo-Pacific. Do you see this as a result of that mandate required nature of German military deployments? That was kind of a long bunch of questions, so I can go over any of that again if you want. Okay, this is uh, very excellent. It's, in Germany, it's very political. And yes, over the last three years, uh, there's a, a, a rising understanding within the German uh, politics that China is not only a nice state, that China is also um, a, a, a threat in certain levels. We see them buying uh, German companies, so they had to change some of the laws that uh, strategic companies can't be bought by foreigners. Uh, we see them at the moment uh, trying to buy the Hamburg Harbor or parts of the Hamburg Harbor, buying parts of the infrastructure. We have seen them buying uh, infrastructure in other countries. So there is a, a rising understanding that China uh, uses its economic power um, also against Europe as well as Germany. And uh, therefore, the idea of sending uh, the Bayern, which just left the harbor in Wilhelmshaven going out uh, on this trip, uh, uh, together with um, our allies, I think it will be U US, French, and UK, uh, doing a, a freedom of navigation movement on the one hand, and then we will also visit China. And now we are on the political side. Don't ask me as military. This is a political decision doing both. And I can't comment any, any longer. I have personal opinion to this, but at the moment, that will be uh, the course of um, things they will do first, uh, the freedom of navigation mission, and later on they will uh, take the uh, harbor visit in China. But China already announced that they will check what the uh, Biden is doing uh, in there, in their waters, and by this they will decide whether the Biden gets a harbor visit or not. All right, great. Thank you, sir. Um, like I said in the chat, I'm going to shift over now to some of the more um, sort of historically uh, looking questions, make sure we cover those. And then first one is from a Mr. Skip Crowley. And actually, this I, I made a little note about this myself when you mentioned it in the earlier slide. Looking at the the reputation of uh, Manstein um, as, you know, and some of the controversies that have been associated with his memoirs. You know, when I when I first saw that, what jumped to me is, um, in sort of in some of the own work I've done and looking at the, you know, the maneuver warfare history, both in the U, you know, U.S. Marine Corps and then the U.S. Army is, you know, there were there were questions raised about, you know, what how how much how much was true and how much wasn't in those kind of memoirs, because, as you noted, Manstein kind of omits some rather large parts of the, you know, the historical narrative that he would have had some insight on. Um, and so do you think that for for you know, some of these exemplars of the operational approach, you know, the U.S. military has looked at people like Manstein and some of the other, you know, Fairmont commanders and sort of a, from a tactical and operational perspective as, you know, you know, being some of the best craftsmen um, uh, of that level. Do you think that um, that those military reputations are still worth looking at from sort of a strictly operational side or do the the do does the glossing over of some things in those memoirs also raise questions about their skills as operational commanders? Uh, I think if you look in the uh, early war times, so 1939, uh, you can say uh, until almost 1942, they were quite successful. They came up with new ideas. They had done a couple of. Uh, of war games before the before the wars, uh, for example, the Panzer Corps. 
and deploying uh, the tanks in a different way, uh, like the others have done, or using uh, the Air Force in a very tactical manner in close air support, and uh, uh, and also using uh, mission command, especially Auftrag tactic, uh, to fight the um, war in a in a very agile way. And uh, if you read uh, Boyd's pattern of conflict, I think there you can see it. There's a story about uh, Rommel that. Uh, initially, when uh, he broke through the Ardennes with his uh, Panzer Division, the initial idea was everyone should go to, to Paris. So, uh, copying the Schlieffen plan from uh, 30 years before, but then they found out that the Brits were retreating into Dunkerque, and um, Rommel gave only the order Rommel Channel Coast. And all his uh, brigades and uh, battalion commanders followed him in the understanding, knowing. On, uh, what the boss is doing, so which is a, is a good example of this uh, close uh, relationship between those commanders and also understand uh, their commitment and understanding of the operational art. Uh, the problem is much time later on is that they never accepted that the Russians at a certain point in time came over their uh, I call it the quality gap they created with the cleanings of 1937 and. In 1943, the Russians became also operational artists. So generals like Zhukov or others, they had also a clear understanding what was going on. So and by this, it's it's, it's almost like the, uh, the the famous citation: "We won every we won every battle, but we lost the war at a certain point in in, in time." So on the tactical level, uh, they were um, great officers, but. Uh, they had no clear strategic understanding what they were doing. Uh, no, they couldn't hold those long lines at a certain point in time, uh, setting the mass of people they would have need in order to cover whole of Russia at a certain point in time. Uh, but when there was a, a small scale battle, they were uh, quite successful with their training. And uh, especially with Manstein, this is what you can see what he when he starts to change history. And this is one line he's changing. Uh, you know, that the Russians were always stupid. And the other side is that he left out that he knew everything what happened in his rear area. Uh, and that he was supporting them. The, the Wehrmacht gave uh, signal companies, the Wehrmacht provided the logistics, they gave the ammunition for killing people in the rear area. And this is nothing you find in his thing. And there is a famous uh, speech of Hitler, and I think it was in 1941, uh, short before they attacked uh, Russia, where Hitler um, uh, collected more than 200 generals and he told them, this fight will be worse. You are gentlemen, but now you have to do it differently. Uh, and history will be grateful for you, but now we have to do things which are not. So they had a clear understanding what they were doing. And for example, using the, te uh, the technique of uh, encircling huge Russian formations, they were never prepared to support those prisoners of war. And they just dumped them and starved them. So the Wehrmacht did not care like the Americans or the Brits in setting up um, prisoner of war camps and so on, because they didn't have the logistics for that. And they had never planned for it. So by this, you could say they were efficient militaries, but they were not in uh, a in line with any honor code of that time and the humanitarian law or the hard law at that time was already clear what you should do and what you didn't do and what they applied on American prisoners of war. They never applied on uh, Russian prisoners of war. And that's the problem my, from my point of view with Manstein. But if you ask an army officer, he will give you another answer. All right, thank you, sir. Um, another question I want to get to again, kind of a more historical flavor to it is. Um, from Mr. Kurt Menke here. And so you, you talked about recreating the German army in the 1950s and some of the changes, uh, including the civic soldier concept. Do you, um, did the, the reformers at the time look back at um, any of the, you know, the sort of the Prussian structure in the early 1800s, especially the idea, ideas of Scharnhorst who had sort of a civic soldier concept in his own mind as well? Yeah, it, it, it moves in, 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 
in, in, in that direction. Uh, Shanas created it after he understood what uh, Napoleon was doing when he created his Levy on Mass because uh, he was able to unite French citizens behind the French flag in order to find these wars. Whereas uh, in the German states, you had uh, sometimes standing armies or you had your farmers which had to follow you at a certain point in time when the Earl or the Count was calling them to, uh, to weapons. And by this, creating uh, a civic soldier as well as the idea of a German nation, uh, the flag to rally around, this is part of Shanos, yes, of, uh, yes, of course. And later on, it became, uh, especially in Prussia, uh, the military became a society inside the society, uh, especially Prussia, the outside society started to copy uh, the military behavior and uh, being a reserve officer as a civilian was uh, almost the same thing like getting a uh, doctorship. So you had uh, the pendulum totally to the other side. You had a, a military militarized society, and this led, uh, this led after World War One into the Reichswehr with the core. And uh, to be fair, I think that uh, they raised 1.5 million soldiers plus SS, plus others during World War II. Uh, but this was a new start saying, okay, we are the German citizens, we are one Germany or a divided Germany, and we are creating an army from citizens for citizens. Goes with Sharnos, because Sharnos at that time, he said, that's more effective. All right, great, thank you, sir. And uh, just looking through the chat again, I think that brings us to the end of our questions and we're getting close to an hour and a half here. So I think it's a good spot to wrap it up. So, um, sir, I'll let you, if you have any last comments or thoughts you'd like to share, um, we'll you go ahead and do that and then we'll call it a day. So I'm, fi I'm fine. And okay. I'm great, grateful for uh, the possibility to talk with you about this. If there are more questions, please collect them and send them. You have my email and I will try to answer them to the best of my knowledge. Okay, great. Well, I appreciate that. And I'll certainly uh, do that for anyone in the audience who has any follow on questions. So, uh, sir, thank you for your time today, especially, uh, you know, crossing multiple time zones again, as we did last week. Uh, we're always grateful at the Crew Lake Center for the flexibility and the, uh, you know, willingness to work with our schedules to make these things happen for a live audience. So to everyone else in our audience as well. Thank you for joining us and make sure you're following us on social media for our upcoming broadcast because we're gonna be highlighting some more of our new non-resident fellows here in later broadcast this month. On August 19th, we'll be hosting Group Captain Joe Brick of the Australian military for a look at military ethics and wargaming. And on 26 August, we will have Marine Corps Captain Walker Mills here to talk to us about the ins and outs of writing as a military professional. So we hope you can join us all uh, for both of those events. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.